Today on The Grave Talks, the historic Farnsworth House Inn in Gettysburg. The historic Farnsworth House Inn is named to honor the Brigadier General Elton John Farnsworth, who led an ill-fated charge after the failure of Pickett's charge and claimed the lives of Farnsworth and 65 of his men. The original part of the house was built in 1810, followed by the brick structure in 1833. The house sheltered Confederate sharpshooters during a three-day conflict, one of whom is believed to have accidentally shot 20-year-old Mary Virginia Jenny Wade, the only civilian who died during the battle. More than 100 bullet holes lined the walls of the Farnsworth Inn. Following the battle, the house served as a hospital. The Lincoln procession even passed the Farnsworth Hospital on November 19, 1863, on the way to the National Cemetery, where he delivered the famous Gettysburg Address. Harvey Sweeney, the owner of the house during the battle, composed a letter to his brother, penning his most insightful and powerful account ever written on this subject. Today, it is a bed and breakfast where guests enjoy the lovely Victorian rooms, a dining experience reminiscent of the Civil War era, and some also experience the undead, the paranormal. It is a very well-known paranormal hotspot in Gettysburg, and that's what we're going to talk about today on The Grave Talks. Well, a lot of that comes from being here during the Battle of Gettysburg because it was one of the bloodiest battles in in history. Um, So a lot of the spirits that inhabit the house are Civil War soldiers and were here from that time. Um, And we've, you know, added some over the years um, as well that we can pick up on readings. And Mary will know a little bit more about that. But a lot of it stems from the Civil War um, and the deaths that happened right here in Gettysburg and, and around the property. Located in an area fraught with death, destruction, anxiety, as a war raged on. War raging on not only in the battlefields, but also in many of the homes of the area. A lot of people, whenever they think about Gettysburg, and this is something that I just you know, learned over the past few years working here, is a lot of people think Gettysburg and they only think about the battlefields. They only think about what happened there. They don't always remember that there was actually fighting in town as well. You know, everyone that was, did not leave town because um, they didn't know that everything was going to be happening right here in town. They hid in their basements. They hid in their homes. And fighting was happening, you know, right on the streets. And there were sharpshooters in many of the homes. Um, so, you know, the soldiers would just come up to these random people's houses and knock on the door and be like, hey, we need your attic. And they'd go up to the attic and they would, you know, station up in there for the three days. Um, and that's sort of what happened in our home. Um, we did have sharpshooters up there. And like I had mentioned before about Jenny Wade, it's thought that the, the bullet that killed her came from our attic. Um, so that's that's something that a lot of people don't realize that, you know, in the morning, the families would go down to the cellars and hide. And then in the evenings, whenever the fighting was over, they would get to come back out and, you know, go back into their house. Um, so that's something that not a lot of people realize about Gettysburg. Um, it had to have been terrifying for the people that were still here. And that's why it's so significant that Jenny Wade was the only civilian that was killed because all of the fighting happened right here in town as well. That That's pretty impressive that only one civilian was killed. What sort of stories today of the paranormal come out of the Farnsworth Inn? Okay, well, what's really cool is in all of our rooms, in all of the rooms of the inn, we have log books that we leave beside the, the bedside and people can write their accounts in it. The earliest one that I came across in the book was from the early 2000s, I believe. And a woman said that she it was actually in the Sweeney room. A lot of people think that our most active room is the Sarah Black room, but given the, the history of the room and the occurrences that I've personally had in the room, the evidence that we've gathered, I would actually lean more towards the side of the Sweeney room being the most active. Um, But she said that she was lying in bed with her husband, and she said it felt like a man, like a heavier set person, had crawled into bed with her and just kind of ran his or her hands down the entire length of her body. And she said she felt the fingers on her body. And I believe that was from 2000, I want to say 2005, 2006, I believe was the earliest one that I had personally heard of. I just came on to the inn not that long ago um, as the investigator, so I'm still getting to learn all of the older stories of the inn. But I did get a chance to talk with the housekeeper today that was kind of going over some of the incidents that she had had while, you know, cleaning the rooms, taking everything down. And she said that she was in the Sweeney room, 
and she heard a young girl call for daddy, like repeatedly just calling for, for daddy. And recently I had learned about the little girl that we have here at the end named Sissy. She's the spirit of a little girl. And she doesn't come through a lot. She's not very like interactive on our investigation. She's more of kind of an observer. But lately she's been letting herself be more known. And so as far as like past experiences that have been significantly logged, I don't know of anything past that because a lot of people come here just wanting like some spooky ghost stories. And I think sometimes people don't realize how active the inn actually is. And when you come here, you get sincere and very validated experiences here because Gettysburg in itself, this entire town, if you think about it, is nothing but a mass grave with just the amount of deaths that have occurred here. And when you have that kind of saturation in the land, you're bound to have significant paranormal activity. And especially, you know, not only the paranormal aspect, but just the rich history of the inn. It's just like a magnet for it. Well, lately, um, I came on full time a few months ago, and I actually started just, I actually found the inn just as going on one of their tours um, on one of their paranormal nights and came in not really expecting too much to happen. And when we were on the tour in our basement, we have um, a mirror that everyone kind of knows about. It's a mirror that was purchased at an antique estate sale. And that mirror gave me the creeps for the second that I had seen it. And a lot of people claim that whenever they're taking photos, they get faces in the photos behind them. They get faces behind the room, like in the back of the room. And I said, okay, I kind of want to try that. And I had gone up to take a flash photo. And in, in one of my photos, standing directly behind me, there's this, I, the best way I can describe it is just this gray mist. It almost looks as if someone was like smoking a cigar, but there was absolutely nobody behind me. And that's the moment that I thought, okay, there might actually be something in this inn. And so I continuously kept coming back and going on tours. And then I stayed here at the inn myself. I stayed in the Jeremy room for the first time ever staying here. And we had gone on a tour previously that night, and it was, an, it was just an absolutely amazing tour. And it's time to go to bed. I believe it was 2 in the morning, right around that. And we're getting into bed, my sister and I. Covers are up. We're kind of relaxing. And then I hear what sounds like a, um, like a roller skate rolling underneath the bed. And I'm thinking, what in the heck is that? So I didn't pay any mind to it. I tried to go to sleep. It was a long evening. And then my sister is on the opposite side of the bed, and she feels the blankets being tugged like from underneath the bed, like someone is tugging them, almost like a child tugging them. And then we try to sleep through that. And then in that morning, I got up, we were getting ready to check out. Underneath the bed, I just wanted to look. Underneath the bed, there is this wooden duck, like a four-wheel, wood, like a four-wheeled wooden duck that was in the center of underneath of our bed. And prior to us going to sleep, it was at the front of our bed. Like there's a um, kind of like an antique chest in the front of the bed at the foot of the bed. And the duck was sitting right in front of it. And then the next morning when we got up, it was in the center of the bed underneath it. And so that experience definitely just kind of validated that, yes, there really is genuine paranormal activity here at the inn. And that was the first full-on solidified experience that I had, and it just made my love for the paranormal even deeper. And so I continued to do tours here until I got the opportunity to actually come on and fill in for an investigator that used to work here and then just fell in love with the spirits that were here. And I have not left since. <laughs> the Farnsworth Inn holds more than just the ghosts of soldiers. There's children that reside within the walls of the inn. Um, well, the little boy we were talking about, his name is Jeremy. Um, he actually, he was five years old. He was killed out in front of the inn here. He was playing outside and he was run over by a horse and carriage. He actually passed away in what is now called the Sarah Black Room. Before the bathroom in the Sarah Black Room was indeed a bathroom, that was his nursery. And so he passed away in that room. And um, he's never left, he's very playful. He is probably, in my opinion, the most active spirit we have in the home. Um, loves to play with women's hair, loves to run up and down the hallway, and people actually leave toys for him, like people that will stay in the Jeremy room not knowing that the room he had actually passed away in is the Sarah Black room, they will leave toys for him in the Jeremy room, which is the room that I had stayed in. And people will leave coins laying, you know, just on the tables and to kind of see if he'll play with them. Well, people have left change laying on the table, come back and it's in a different position or it will be stacked up. So that's something that's really neat. And then 
we have the spirit of a little boy named Jonathan who came through and told us that he came, actually came from the Gettysburg Orphanage, which I'm not sure if you know too much of the history on that place. It was absolutely horrible with how they treated the children there. And he said that he basically had attached to a woman that had gone on a tour at the orphanage and then came here. And he said that he liked it here, so he decided to stay. And so in order to validate him, I like to ask a series of my own questions just to try to get the best validation as you know that I can. And so I said, okay, if you came from the orphanage, Jonathan, can you tell me the name of the headmistress that was running it? And he said, Rosa. And I looked into it, and the woman that did indeed run the orphanage that did those horrible atrocities to those children, her name was indeed Rosa. And so that very much validated him for me. And he absolutely loves horses, absolutely loves toy horses. And a lot of people will actually bring horses here and leave for him to play with. On one of my recent tours, a man had two young children at home and actually had a horse that he had brought with him to leave for Jonathan. And it's one of those heavier rubber horses. He had sat it down on the floor of the attic and just had a K2 meter running just to see what, we, what he would get. Well, he was continuing, continuing to talk to Jonathan. And in the middle of a conversation, the horse just topples over. Wow. And now people can say, oh, that's just gravity. Someone was moving. For the size of the horse and the weight that it was, it would take a little bit of oomph to knock that over. And the time, and when my sister had the spirit box running, we were hearing giggling, like little boys giggling and playing. And then another child that we have, I don't know too much about her. Her name is Sissy. She passed away at the end in the early 1800s. She said that she was sick. I'm think, I'm st for my belief, what I've always got, I'm leaning towards the pneumonia side of it. And she's not super talkative. She's more of an observer. Every now and then she'll come through. She likes to put her hands on your leg, almost as if she's like just kind of playing with you or like peeking around at you to kind of see what's going on. And um, she's, yeah, she's another child that we have. And then like um, Sarah had mentioned, we have a lot of soldier activity here. Obviously, I mean, the first day of battle essentially was fought right outside of our front door. And so Mr. Sweeney, as she had touched on, him and his house guests, which were mainly um, close family uh, relatives and friends, took refuge in that basement during the, day, during the battle, during the day. Sure. And one of the spirits that we have down in the basement, his name is Michael. He, was a, he is a 17-year-old boy that was killed during the first day of the battle and actually passed away where our basement steps would be leading into our basement. Um, he gives off this feeling of just overwhelming sadness. And his message is, he has a message for his mother. I have never been able to get that message from him. He has never said it, or ha at least nothing that I've been able to hear. So I don't think he's necessarily ready to give that message yet. Um, and then another one we have down in the basement is Walter. He is one of our more infamous spirits here at the house. Um, he's very active. Um, he's not necessary. He's not a very, he's not a negative spirit, but he's not a very happy spirit either. Um, he was shot in the abdomen right outside of our inn as well and passed away actually in the basement of our inn. And he does not like women whatsoever. Um, he will actually make women feel violently ill and give them intense abdominal pain, which I actually experienced on one of my first tours here. And I had no idea what was going on. And then the guide at the time had told me the story of Walter, and it all then had added up. Well, the, day, the reasoning that I got as to why he does hate women is the day before he passed away, he received a Dear John letter from his wife, letting him know that you will not have a family or a home to come home to if you survive this battle. So that's unfortunate, but highly understandable as well. Is there anything that seems to trigger his appearance when people are touring the inn? Yes, absolutely. Um, for whatever reason, when people come there, because we get a lot of skeptics, too. Um, a lot of people will like to make fun of the Confederacy to a point and say, well, how does it feel that you lost the war? That will set him off, and things will get much more active when, when people are very disrespectful like that. And he also gets very angry when women speak down there, especially if they try to speak directly to him. He does not. He does not take kindly to that whatsoever. Um, also, you know, he was a Confederate soldier, so he, people of different races, can he can trigger him. 
we've had some very nasty things said during our during our investigations, but again, that's a soldier from that time period. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, we've had some some not nice things happen to him or happen thanks to him. And there's actually a door in our basement that leads to a back room. And we just had one woman that just would not stop hammering, hammering at Walter and just consistently making fun of the Confederacy. And when she was doing that, the door to that room, it sounded as if someone had punched it from the opposite side of the door. And then over our spirit box, we got this low and loud growling noise. And so there are definitely things that trigger Walter. My main things that I have seen firsthand have been women, people that can that disrespect the Confederacy, and also union music. People, something that I've been trying to do lately is, you know, a lot of people think of trigger objects as actual objects, but music is also a trigger object in my opinion. And so I'll play union songs you know, that would have been sung or listened to during the battle. And he gets so active when I do that. And it's not positive. He, there's a lot of name calling, a lot of screaming and shouting, but it is a way that I can get him to open up. It is a way that I can get him to communicate. And so that's why I kind of do that. So yeah, there's definitely significant triggers that can trigger Walter down there. When people are staying there or just on a ghost tour, do you ever encourage them to take actions that you know would likely conjure up these ghosts that is such an awesome question i love that you asked that i am 50 50 on that i feel like there's ways that you can make that you can have kind of initiate a spirit to communicate more but i don't think it should be done in a disrespectful manner because how i look at investigating as a whole you get in what you put what you give off and so if you go in with negative intentions i believe you're going to get more of a negative response but if you go in with sincerity and just a genuine interest in the paranormal and the spirits, I believe you get good things back, that you will have positive things happen. And I feel like, unfortunately for that woman, she did not have good intentions when she was trying to speak to Walter. And I believe that's why she was affected so badly. Mm-hmm. Because after that had happened, this, over our spirit box, it had actually said her name. And it had said her husband's name, who was actually not even there. And so at that point, she was done. She no longer wanted to continue the tour, and she actually left. And so I think in order to answer that question, it, I have to go off of the people that I have in my tour, what part of the home we're in, and, and just the overall vibe of the, of the inn, because it does, it, it changes. The inn, it's alive. The inn is very alive with the spirits that we have here. And so it's a day-by-day thing. And so I never, ever encourage people to be disrespectful or just over the top with trying to antagonize the spirits. I would never recommend that. Because it does sound like there are so many ghost children at the historic Farnsworth House Inn. Let me ask you this. Do you have any evidence or any experiences where they seem to be interacting with one another? You know Absolutely. I mean? And that's the... Oh. See, you're asking some of the best questions. I knew this this was going to be fun. Um, yes, absolutely. They interact with each other all the time. Um, I use a piece of equipment. I have spirit boxes. I have SB7, SB11. I also have what's called the Phasma box. And when I turn that on, I, I put in an external speaker so everybody can hear. And we, w- we can literally hear them having conversations amongst themselves playing. And we can hear them running around and, like, having conversations within one another. And we actually heard one night on my tour... This woman bought, brought a red bouncy ball along for Jeremy to play with. And Jeremy said, thank you. And then we heard another little boy said, I want to play with that, Jeremy. And then we heard giggling. So there's definitely, they definitely interact with one another. And just on my last tour, I've always gotten evidence on my, there's not one investigation that I've ever done here where people have not left having an experience. And we were in the attic. They're in, and it's, we have one, some of the best display cases up there with actual artifacts. And the children like have told us they like to hide behind there and they like to play back there. And so what was really fun is I brought some new toys for the kids and I had placed them behind. And Jeremy, he loves cars. He loves playing with cars. Sissy loves dolls and Jonathan loves horses, as I had mentioned. I, at the time, did not know that Jonathan loved horses as much as he did. So I, I had brought him cars to play with. And I put them down, and Jeremy had gone, Mary, and I talked to them as if, you know, they're people, because in my opinion, they are. And I said, yes, honey. And he said, Jonathan likes horses. He doesn't want cars. 
And so that leads me to believe they are having, they can have intelligent conversations amongst themselves. They're very aware of each other's presence in the home. So ab- absolutely, I definitely, all the spirits in the home definitely interact from the evidence that I've gotten without a, sh- I have no, no doubt in my mind about that. Uh, clearly, these children are from a completely different place and time. So when you put out toys for them, do you need to put out toys that they would recognize that would have existed in their era? Or can you put out, say, a current matchbox car and, and they'll figure it out? What what are the, the stipulations that you found uh, that seem to work or, or not work when, when putting out toys for the kids? And see, that's what's so, I love that you asked that. That's actually what I'm trying to figure out now. Um, because it's so hard to find toys that would be from their time. So... I got Sissy just a, just a plain little baby doll, just in a pink dress. And with Jonathan, I can just get him a regular horse. But it's cool with Jeremy is, I don't know if he's going to, because some of these Matchbox cars are crazy looking. I mean, they have dragons that have wheels on them now. It's just insane. And, and lately I've been wondering if what he thinks of these new toys, whether he knows what to do with them, or if he's like, what the heck did this lady just bring me? And so that's actually something I'm looking into now. As I get to go on these investigations with people and I have people come on my tours, we dig into that kind of thing. We like to find out as much as we can about these spirits because on my investigations and my tours, I don't want to just have people ask cookie cutter questions or just kind of sit there and be in the background. I want people to be as interactive as possible. And so the questions that you're asking are are asking me are questions that I'm asking the spirits or questions other people are asking, but... I, I, I don't know how to answer that at this point. I think he definitely thinks they're interesting. We'll definitely say that. And when I actually went up into the attic today with my sister before, before we did the interview, I wanted to go up and see the Matchbox cars just to see if they were moved because we were the last tour that were up there. And what was cool is I had put cars underneath the benches in the back of the room behind the display cabinet. Well, how when Sarah had touched on the window that the bullet that was said to have struck Jenny Wade came from, there was a line of matchbox cars back there, right in front of the window, just three cars lined up. And I said, that's so strange because they were not there the last time they were up there. So I definitely think he's playing with them. Sometimes I don't think he knows what to think of the new toys that we have, but I think he still likes them. I think he appreciates getting them. No, I don't think he'd know what to do with a Game Boy <laughs> if, I, if I left him a Game Boy, but I think cars are pretty. Cars are kind of one size fits all. I think he knows how to handle those, but sure. that is an awesome question. I mean, we've had um, sp- people have been on their cell phones and we've had um, the kids ask what they were or what they were doing, and they've asked if they could play with them which is really cool. So we'll have people open their cell phones and turn their flashlight apps on. Mm-hmm. We've actually had the spirits turn the phone flashlights on and off, mm-hmm. which has been so fascinating to see that kind of, just that kind of phenomenon happen. And these spirits, they're so intelligent and they really, each of them have such a different personality. And that is why I sincerely love each spirit we have here. Even Walter, even though Walter can be a bit of a handful at times. Luckily, the children are not left unattended. There's some ghostly parental figures that roam the halls as well. We have a spirit here named Mary, who is just one of the most, she's just so kind. Um, She was actually a midwife. She passed away here at the inn of an unknown illness. Her death was kind of unknown. Um, Recently, over my spirit box, she had hinted at being poisoned. And so that is something I'm still digging in to find out because I'm not able to find anything else out on her other than what she, what she tells me. And um, her role in the home is kind of a protector. She protects the children. She watches out for the children. And that's right along the same lines of what Michael does. Michael loves to protect the children. Um, recently, we had a beautiful wedding here at the inn. And that evening, the evening after the wedding, we had a, I had a tour to do an investigation, and over our Phasma box, Jeremy let us know that Michael took them to the wedding and that the bride was beautiful. And the kids were very adamant to let me know that they behaved, that they listened to Michael. And we've had some negative things happen, but um, they definitely, Mary and Michael are definitely protectors of the children. Mary has a very loving presence to her. Her number one sign that you can kind of tell that she's around is just a very comforting feeling. Um, she's been known to caress um, our guests' arms when they've been sitting in the basement or in the attic. But she kind of goes all over the inn. She's not tied to um, one area more so than the other. Um, so we have Mary, 
And then we have um, William, who was a Lieutenant Confederate sharpshooter. He mainly inhabits the attic. He does not like to talk too much. He will on occasion, the couple of times that he has come through, he said the name Jenny and he, that he was sorry. And now me as an investigator, I take things with a grain of salt until I can get a little more information. And so I don't know if he might may have been the one that fired that bullet that was said to have struck Jenny Wade. And what's really cool is I actually got the opportunity to speak to the people at the Jenny Wade home. And they said that they also did a test that they had charted the path of the bullet and that it did indeed lead back here to the inn, which is fascinating. And so William is, he was a Lieutenant Confederate sharpshooter. That is what we got from him. I want to ask a question about a statement you made uh, earlier where you were talking about the adult ghosts protecting the children ghosts. What exactly would you say they're protecting the children from? Um, well, I had touched on earlier that we have this mirror in the basement that was purchased at an antique sale. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure you have heard of her, Lorraine Warren, mm-hmm. famous, renowned demonologist Lorraine Warren, um, had actually come and saw the mirror. Um, she, because of recent, because of activity that was picking up, picking up upon purchase of the mirror, she had given the instructions to cover the mirror with a black shawl for three years. I do not, I was not here when that had happened, so I don't know a lot about it. All I know is we've gone from numerous spirits of the home that that mirror is indeed a portal and that things can come and go. And when Michael tells the children to go get Mary on our last tour, we were told it was because the intruder was in, was in the inn, which is a negative spirit that is said to come through the mirror in our basement. And I've dealt with him a few times. It's not pleasant. I don't, at this point, I don't know if it is a human spirit or if it is something else, but he is very negative and he is very nasty. And so Michael is very adamant about keeping him away from the kids of the home. And on my last tour, the one that I had touched on earlier about, we had people leave the tour early because of activity that was happening in the attic. There was only four people on my tour that evening, and everything was very positive in the attic. The children were coming through. Um, People had actually had physical touches. A woman on my tour had her hair played with. And there's also, there's a review on uh, the Farnsworth and Facebook page about about this incident. And she had her hair played with. And then Jeremy came through the box and said that it was him and that he was playing. And everything was very positive. The children were being very active. And then the energy in the room shifted, and it shifted very quickly. The attic, always it's always chilly. It's an attic. And it went from just being chilly to being able to physically see your breath. And then the children just went silent. We heard Michael come over and told the children to go find Mary and to hurry. And then the children stopped coming through entirely. It was only Michael that continued to come through. And all he was saying was, leave them alone, leave them alone, stop it, leave them alone. And me, I asked Michael, I said, are we safe up here? Because at that point, it did not feel like we were. And a woman on my tour started to say the Lord's Prayer. Well, when she had started to recite that prayer over our seared box, a very deep, a very low but loud growling noise. And then he said, stop it, very loud, very adamantly. And so at that point, I knew that it was no longer safe to be in the attic. And Michael, I told Michael, I said, okay, well, we're going to leave. We're going to listen to you. And he said, run, hurry. So I got in the guests out. The two men had taken my backpack for me. Okay, we took all the, they took the equipment downstairs. I'm locking the attic up. And I'm standing at the steps because our attic door is very close to the steps. And I heard, we heard running from like the opposite end of the attic to the door where I was, where I was locking it. And it, then it had just stopped at the door. And then it had slowly walked away, almost as if it, had, if it had charged at the door to be like, hey, I'm here and I'm not leaving. And then just calmly walked away. And after that, nobody wanted to continue the tour. Um, we didn't even get to the basement that evening. And so that was probably one of the strongest reasons that I believe that they are so protective of the children is because of the things that can come in and out of that mirror down there. I suppose the obvious question at this point would be, why not just get rid of the mirror? Oh, that is a fantastic idea. I would <laughs> love that. However, people see it as an attraction. And when you have good spirits, it's kind of yin and yang. When you have the good, you also have bad. And so I feel like even if we would remove the mirror, 
if something negative had come through that mirror and they see that you remove their way of getting out, my fear is that activity would just pick up more and that it would be more so negative activity picking up. And so we've done, we recently had to do a, a blessing of the inn because for whatever reason, people love to bring Ouija boards here. They love to use the Ouija board at the end, which I am completely against. Um, and so activity started to pick up after that. And that was in our Jenny Wade room. And for whatever reason, people, whenever they bring Ouija boards, it's always the Jenny Wade room. And it's, I don't know if they think that it's tied to Jenny Wade, but it is not in any way. It is just a, na- a room named after her. And it, it got very negative. It got very heavy for a while. And it led to just having to do an entire house, ble- excuse me, house blessing of the inn. Being such an active location, uh, you're going to obviously get a lot of people in and out of there, some much more professional than others. When you have a guest that uh, that shows up with a Ouija board, maybe has really no idea what they're doing with it, what it can do, what it can't do. They think it's just a toy from the shelf of a defunct Toys R Us. Is there any concern there? Is there is there any any hesitation uh, to allowing someone to to use a device like that to try and communicate uh, somewhat recklessly. Yes, absolutely. Actually, um, for a while here at the end, there's actually if you were caught with a Ouija board, you were fined, and because they they took it very seriously here, and people use these Ouija boards and they think that it's just they think that it's just this game and that it's something fun to do and you get to talk to ghosts and that's not it. When you use something like a Ouija board. You are opening yourself up. You are essentially making yourself a door. And pe- things can come and go through you when you're using this Ouija board. And it makes me crazy that they just sell these things at Toys R Us or Walmart, Kmart. They make these so accessible. And people don't understand the repercussions of their actions when they're using these, when they're using these boards. They have no idea the things that can come and go through them and the lifelong consequences from it. I've heard horror stories of people using Ouija boards and what has happened. And so I absolutely think that people have come here using them and that they have thinking that they can leave the board here and it, you know, it'll just stay here. That's not the case. When you use a Ouija board, you yourself, you are opening this door to, to the other side and you, you can't control what's coming through. And so things can attach to you very easily. They don't necessarily have to stay here. They can follow you. But unfortunately, recently with the Ouija board that that the lead of housekeeping had found in the Jenny Wade room, I wanted to do an investigation in that room. You know, spirit box session, some dowsing rods, K2 meters. And we had a spirit of a man named Edward that came through and said that he came through the game. And I said, what game? And he said he came through the board and that he was not leaving. Now, at this point, I don't truly believe that he, that his name is Edward. I don't even think that it's a man, just because of the energy that was in the room at that time. So I definitely think that some people have came here with Ouija boards and have not understood the things that they were conjuring here. And it led to some severe repercussions here at the end, unfortunately. And it also affected some of the spirits here. Well, the fact that things like that can happen and, and dark things uh, seem to uh, come through from time to time or exist with with the object there you were talking about earlier. Have you ever had a guest come to you uh, and say, you know what, I know it's kind of, but this this thing over here, this occurrence, this, this situation I was in really, really made me feel uncomfortable in a dark way. Yes, absolutely. Um, just recently, we had a woman staying in the Sweeney room. She was there by herself. She was just in town on business, and she had the Sweeney room for two evenings. Um, she said that she had gone to bed, and in the Sweeney room, the closet is a very narrow closet as it was back then. Back, you know, that's how they were back in the day. And she said that she was lying in bed, and that she had this tall, dark figure. She said it had no face. It was just, it was just in the shape of a human, a very large human had come out of the closet and just walked to the foot of her bed and just stood there and looked at her for a few moments and then had just dissipated. Um, also, unfortunately, with we had the attic incident that I told you about. Another thing we had happened is on one of my tours down in the basement, I had told you about Walter. Well, there's also something else in the basement. I don't know what it is yet. I'm still trying to figure it out, but it's in that back room. 
Um, the room, the back room was blessed a few, a few years ago because of an incident that I can't go into that had occurred back there. Um, so there's a lot of negative energy in that back room. And mind you, that back room is one of the most original parts of the inn. It's the foundation. And I had a guest, thought it would be fun to go open the door. And on my investigations, that is not allowed. I do not allow people back there for their, for their own safety. And he thought it would be fun to go there and rip the door open and start taunting whatever's back there. Well, when he had opened the door, I did not hear it. Nobody else in the room had heard it. But he said that he heard a very loud growl and a hissing noise. And he said the hissing was so close, he actually felt the breath in his ear. And then he said it felt like something had just gone through him. So he came out of there, slammed the door shut, and just left. He left the room, left the tour. And so there are definitely, there are negative things here, but the good far outweighs the bad here. And like I touched on earlier, what you give out is what you get back. If you come here with good intentions towards the spirits here, they will not harm you. But if you come here looking to provoke, looking to stir things up, I feel like you're going to bite off more than you can chew, to be quite honest. A lot of times I think when people think of communicating with the other side, they think of it being very much a Q&A and just asking and receiving a response. But with what you're describing, it, it's almost, to me, sounds like you're, you're getting that at times, but you're also getting almost like a quick snapshot into their interactions with one another, and you're just picking up a few words back and forth of them communicating amongst themselves, really with no intent to even let you hear, but you just happen to be picking it up because of the device that you're using. Would you say that's that's an accurate uh, assumption of what's going on? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the last time we were, um, I had a tour a couple weeks ago, we were in the attic, and this guy was just so tired. He was falling asleep, and the spirit of Mary was up there with us, and Michael, of course, because Michael usually likes to stay in the attic. And I heard Mary came through and she said, he looks like he's tired. And Michael said, yeah, let's go spook him. And then the man that was sitting. Now, another way I used to validate, I'm just going to let you know, so it kind of makes more sense. When my sister and I do these investigations together, when we have our spirit box running, I will give her headphones, very good headphones, and she will plug it into the spirit box. So she cannot hear what any of us are saying or what any of us are asking the spirits. She will only say what she hears. And so sometimes I'll be asking them questions and they completely disregard my questions and they're just talking amongst themselves, which is absolutely hysterical. But it is, it is almost like when you hear them having conversations and you hear that intelligent interaction between them, it is like getting a glimpse into their personalities, into who they are. Because to me, you know, they're not just, they're not dead people. They're, I mean, obviously they're spirits, but they're still very much people and they're very intelligent. And to hear them get to have conversations amongst themselves, not that they were ignoring us, but to know that they have a life inside of this inn, that they're not just trapped here, that they can carry on. They have, they can communicate, they can live lives inside of this inn. And I feel like that's why it's so important for the people that we have come in here to respect that and to know that when you come to this inn, you are essentially coming into their home. We just happen to work here. <laughs> This inn is their home, and it will forever be their home. And people need to come in with that love and that respect for them, because absolutely, the, the spirits here are very intelligent. They have conversations amongst themselves that sometimes we're lucky enough to catch. And we've actually caught Mary telling the children that she loved them very much. And that was, as a mother, it was very sweet to hear, because, you know, when you think of a child's spirit, it's very sad. No, you never think of, you know, when a child, when a child passes away of them staying. You think that they're going to be moving on and be at peace. And for a long time when I was doing investigations, I would think, how can these children not be at peace, these innocent little children? And that's still something that I don't know. But talking to them and getting to communicate with them the opportunities that I get, I know that they're happy here, that they like being here. I mean, Jonathan that came from the orphanage came here and stayed here for a reason. And so I absolutely think that they have a ton of interaction amongst themselves that when we do get to see those little glimpses of their true personalities, that that itself is just a gift in doing what we do with, the, with these investigations. So, yeah, definitely, that was, that was actually that was an awesome question. <laughs> it's such an interesting view that we're now able to see, I think, for the first time of this interaction. And it's not just 
them trying to give a message to us. We're, we're getting a glimpse into their world. It really is. And we actually, um, the one time that I didn't have a tour, I just wanted to come here and talk to them. Because when you are around this, when you're when you're in this in for periods of time like I am, you get to almost look at the spirits here as family, and and, and and for lack of a better word, because you form this bond with them. And so I don't ask them, you know, the generic questions are, you know, what was it like to die? Why are you here? Have do you want to move on? I don't ask them things like that. I'll ask them. I said, do you want to listen to music? Like, what's your favorite kind of music? And I'll look music up from their time, and then I'll play them something from my time. The communication that I have with them, I don't want them to think that they're show monkeys because that's what makes me crazy about some of the tours here in Gettysburg. They're very commercialized, and they lack that genuine authenticity. And so when I, com- when I do my investigations, I think that's why I'm very successful in it. I talk to them like they are my friends. I talk to them like they are my family with having that, gen- that genuine sincerity and that compassion for them. That I don't want to just get their, their messages. I just want to be there to listen to them sometimes, that if they need to talk about anything, if they need any help with anything. I feel like a lot of times, especially when you watch these horrible shows like Ghost Adventures or any of these very gimmicky shows, more often than not, they're asking things that are inappropriate to ask. In my opinion, that sometimes they can just get blatantly disrespectful to spirits. And here at the Farnsworth, that's not how we operate. We absolutely love the spirits that we have here. It's something that I've come to the conclusion of in many, many interviews now on the topic of, of a haunting. And a haunted place that, for the most part, uh, seems as if the inhabitants, the, the undead inhabitants... Uh, are are fairly happy is that maybe they're not wanting to move on to another place the the assumption forever seems to have been help them move on to the light help them move on to this place or wherever the end game may be but would you say that that these ghosts these children these adults ghost caretakers of the children they almost seem to be in a happy place they almost seem like maybe this is their end game and this is their light. This is where they want to be. Yes, absolutely. See, you ask the best questions. Um, absolutely. Um, I've actually had Michael tell me I because he was so young when he passed away. He was only seventeen. That's you know, it's a baby yet. I said, Michael, are you at peace? And he said that he chose to stay. I flat out wanted to ask him. I said, when you passed away, did you have the opportunity to move on? Is there a grand white light? And he said that he chose to stay, that he was at peace here. And I said, what about the children? Because, you know, people ask children spirits like, oh, why didn't you go into the light? Did you, do you want to move on? These kids are children. They have no idea what you're talking about. You have to talk to them in the appropriate age that they are. And so I asked Michael, I said, are, these, are the children here at peace? Are they happy? And he said, yes that that is his job to take care of them, but they are happy and that they are at peace. So I think that there's a very naive kind of blanket understanding that when someone passes away, we're going to see this grand white light. We're going to walk up and be judged and go wherever we're meant to go. I personally have seen too many things. I've had way too many interactions with spirits to believe that. I believe that there's so much more out there that we do not know yet. I'm by no means saying that, you know, there's not a God. I mean, obviously... With what I do, you're, I'm, I would be naive to say that. I absolutely know that there is heaven and hell, God and Satan. It's, that's just a, a given. But numerous spirits have told me different things. I was doing a, a session out in the battlefield, and I had a spirit told me, tell me that he was afraid to move on and be judged because of what he had done while he was alive. And so I feel like every spirit is different as to why, why they chose to stay. And a lot of times people say, if you've suddenly, if you've died a sudden death, you, you know, you're stuck here, you're trapped here. I don't necessarily believe that. I still believe that you have the opportunity to move on and that you have kind of a say in that matter. Because I've had spirits tell me that they could move on, but they didn't want to because they were scared. Mm-hmm. And then I've also had spirits of women come through, like of the soldiers that I've talked to, tell me that they did move on and that they came back to be with their loved one. And so there's so much out there that we don't know, and there's just this blanket of, under, of this misunderstanding that everything's black and white, and that's not the case at all. There's, there's so much out there. There are so many options, and 
every spirit that I've talked to has had a different reason as to why they are still here. So that's my best take on on that. <laughs> Obviously, the historic Farnsworth House Inn has been around since around 1810 and will very likely be standing for more generations to come. What's your hope for the future of this building, of this building? My hope going forward for the inn is just that I'm hoping that it's going to remain in the Schultz family for a long time. But let's say it would indeed go to someone else. At the end of the day, my only hope is that it remains this wonderful inn that it is, that it is cared for, that it is kept up to the standard that it is now, and that the next people that would come in realize that they have these beautiful beings inside the walls here. This inn is soaked with history. It is soaked with so much just enriching history. And and the spirits that are here are a part of that. And so to be able to work here and get the to get to know these spirits here, my only wish for them in the future is to is peace and to have this and remain here for them, for the people that come here, to respect them, to learn to learn about these people that we have here. And and I want more people to visit the inn. I want because the thing is the spirits love when people come here. They love when people come to communicate with them because we are giving them a voice, essentially. We are letting them know you are not forgotten. Even though you are no longer physically here, you are not forgotten. And that is the most beautiful thing about the Farnsworth, is the people here treat them with respect. And a lot of people that come in on my, on my tours, on my investigations, are the same way. And so that's essentially my only hope for the end going forward, is just that we continue to have this beautiful almost like family here and that we have more people come here and visit we have more investigators come because there's so many stories within these walls that are just begging to come out and sometimes it takes the right person to tell that right story that's just waiting to be told special thanks to sarah and mary from the historic farnsworth inn for discussing their ghosts with us today on the Grave Talks. If you'd like to learn more about the historic Farnsworth House Inn, you can visit farnsworthhouseinn.com. That wraps up today's episode of The Grave Talks. If you like our program, please press subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to us on. Let your friends know that we exist. Share the show on social media. And of course, those reviews help us tremendously. Please give us some stars and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, whatever platform it is you listen to us on. That helps us tremendously. And thank you in advance for that support. Until next time for The Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.